to other spaces where people make their lives have histories. I often think about camps as just existing in the, the moments in which we encounter them. But they have as much history as any other space built environment. And, um, you know, kind of a side note, when I was applying for research grants to support the research that ultimately became this book, um, I applied for a grant from the National Science Foundation, which supports anthropological field work, and I did in the end get the grant, but I got some pushback from a reviewer um, who argued that, um, you know, doing a study about humanitarianism, good, important subject, um, but, the, but why do the, what, the reviewer described as the pathological case, uh, that is Palestinians. Um, and the, you know, the claim being that Palestinians are not refugees because they're never going home, um, and that where they live are not camps because they look like slums in, in, you know, that you would see around the world. And obviously I viewed that um, response as a political response. Um, but it does, in fact, even if it's, even if it's a, just a, a polit politically rejectionist uh, position about taking Palestinian experience seriously, it does actually reflect something that I think is a widespread feeling that people have, or expectation that people have about what it means to be a refugee, and what a refugee camp, or what a refugee experience would be, which is, again, this very short-term kind of crisis situation. Um, so one of the things that, I, that, is, that I'm looking at in my research, and that is kind of a sense a, one of the key central themes of the book is to think about what happens when these categories, these places, <coughs> these systems that are designed to respond to crisis extend over time. Right? When the refugee category is a, a category within which people live over generations, you know, which is a category of not just bureaucratic regulation, but of identity that people are born into. And when camps um, have to change over time. So to like, you know, take us back, you know, at the beginning of you know, the first years after 1948, many camps did look exactly like what you would imagine a, you know, a typical, this, this fits the kind of pictures of what we would think of as refugee camps. Um, in this picture on the left, that, that big tent in the front is being used as a, as a school. Um, but also, one, some camps from even from the beginning start, didn't start as tents. There was repurposed uh, military barracks in various places that were used as camps. Um, and then, um, both over time and in some of the later camps, you have these kind of prefab uh, units that, um, so this is still the, the image of the Matka camp. You still have um, the kind of, um, visually it is as imagined by the humanitarian actors, but it is no longer um, you know, tense. Um, but then over time, the, the kind of humanitarian design gets muffled mm. in the experience of living in, in these places as people build, whether they're supposed to or not, um, as, they, as they live, as they have commerce. Uh, these are, the, for anybody who's been to um, refugee camps in Lebanon, one of the, you know, every, every camp is distinct, even though there are shared, shared features across them, and one of the very notable things about um, the camps around Beirut is how crowded they are, how narrow, um, the pathways are, so these were the streets in the camps, and and what is visually very distinctive are these, like, the sort of jerry rigged um, water and electricity. And again, so that's a, a feature of the camp in Lebanon, but it's also a feature of life in Lebanon, right? So it's not only in the camps that you have this, this problem of electricity. So the camps have some relation infrastructurally, um, materially, to the places where they are, as well as by, um, by virtue of being um, camps themselves. And you know, so the Palestinian refugee case is a kind of an extreme example of a long-term displacement experience. But long-term displacement is, or in the terms that the UNHCR, the UN High Commissioner for Refugees uses, protracted displacement is a majority refugee experience, in fact. Um, and so you know, I think that scholars, practitioners, publics, everybody who's thinking about refugees, we have to confront and recognize the <coughs> fact that long-term humanitarian presence and then long-term experience of displacement is not, in fact, exceptional. Right? This is this is the more frequent experience. Um, and so the you know the goal of my book is to look at the Palestinian refugee experience living over seven decades with and um, in relation to and in opposition to um, 
the humanitarian assistance regime that has, that has to also confront this extended period of time. And so the book is organized basically around um, exploring two sets of questions. Um, one, which is think, you know, directed at thinking about humanitarianism as an enterprise. So what happens to humanitarianism and humanitarian assistance as it becomes long term, as it has to deal with chronic conditions as much as crisis situations? Um, how is humanitarian purpose challenged and redefined in those contexts? So when you're dealing with things like challenges of old age, when you are dealing with populations who may not, who are not um, at, at, in facing the threat of death, you know, from an immediate, you know, war or famine, but whose lives are very directly constrained and shaped by the conditions in which they live. Um, and how are humanitarian mandates and constituencies stretched and reconfigured um, and also limited in the face of all of these circumstances? So thinking about long-term humanitarianism as a both particular but common um, kind of conundrum for the humanitarian industry. And then the second set of questions are about how Palestinians um, who have lived with this apparatus for 70 years, how do they pursue their lives in politics? Right? When this is the context in which people are living, how do people live with it? What do they do with it? Um, and what do, they, what do they do around it, through it? Right? You know. um, and, and particularly in this context, I'm interested in the ways in which humanitarian procedures and discourses and materials can provide tools for as much as impediments to making <coughs> claims and living lives. And there's been a lot of um, attention, particularly in the anthropological scholarship on humanitarianism, which has grown enormously over the last 15 years or so. When I first started thinking about these questions, there was not a, a great deal of work about humanitarianism. Um, and now it's a huge topic in the field. But a lot of the focus has been on the ways in which humanitarian apparatuses, humanitarian discourse, humanitarian categories is limiting for recipients limits people to the position of the victim, constrains the things that they can do, con is constrained in how it can recognize people. And all of those limits are very real, and it's something that I've thought about in the, in the context of Palestinian um, experiences with humanitarianism. But that's not all that we need to understand about what unfolds in a humanitarian environment. Because as real as those constraints are, people don't just say, okay, well, that's, that's the constraint of the system, so that's it, I'm not gonna do anything. People, people are busy making their own lives and trying to change the, the system. So that's part of what I'm interested in. So there's kind of a two-fold um, analytic lens that I developed and I'm looking one at um, the humanitarian politics of life, which is a, you know, a, a term that, that a lot of people um, use to describe you know, the governance of bodies and populations in the management of aid delivery, right? So, um, sort of deriving from Michel Foucault's arguments about biopolitics. Um, but I'm also very interested in what I would describe as the politics of living within humanitarian spaces. So kind of focusing the attention as not just on what is done to people, but on what people do, how they survive and, and strive within those spaces. Focus on Palestinians, um, works in Lebanon, Syria, Jordan, West Bank, and Gaza. Uh, so five fields of operations. Uh, and that has shifted over time, but obviously what the nature of those fields are. And, and very originally, the UNRWA had, did some work uh, limited in Iraq and worked in Israel for, for the first couple of years of its existence. Um, and I am looking across seven decades. So basically from 1948, when I started the project, I would say from 1948 to the present. Um, but one, eventually you need to stop. Um, but also there was kind of the, the, the Sir, the war in Syria and the new kinds of displacements and new kinds of changes that emerged out of that, in the end, kind of marked an ending point of my research, because that's not, you know, that's the next thing. So it's basically from 1948 to Syria, in, in some sense. Um, and I did field work primarily, like my, my most extensive field work was in four refugee camps, as I noted, in Jeddah, Wahdat, uh, so two in Jordan, Borja Barajne in Lebanon, and Dehesha in the West Bank. So in those three fields of operation. Um, 
again, when I first embarked on this project, I intended to do field work in Syria. Um, that became impossible. Gaza is very difficult um, to do research in now, but as Kinda mentioned, I did, I did a lot of um, archival and ethnographic field work in Gaza for earlier projects that I draw on. Um, but I do have an archival record uh, that covers all of these fields. That, that includes both UNRWA records and other, the work of other organizations. And in my field work in the camps, I did both um, you know, interviews with hundreds of people, um, looking both at people, people refugees of, from multiple generations, and humanitarian workers, and of course, people who are both, is one thing that is, that is notable in this situation, but is also not in any way unique to this situation, is that the majority of on the ground humanitarian workers are themselves refugees. So the, that you can distinguish analytically the category of refugee and aid worker, but those are not demographically different a lot of the time, right? There's a lot of, there's a lot of overlap. Um, and I also observed a number of different humanitarian uh, projects and actions, so to get a sort of sense of some of the different kinds of things that people are doing. So this, this is just gives you a sense of, of the projects and programs that I was looking at in different places. And what I was trying to do was look at um, both different organizations, but also different kinds of organizations. So MSF, Doctors Without Borders, right, this is like, you know, one of the most famous Inter large international humanitarian organizations. Um, also in the same camp, I was looking at projects that were being done by camp-based NGOs, you know, um, very local kinds of NGOs. Some UNRWA projects. Um, the, in Jeddah, the Community Development Office is kind of an E, it was an EU-funded, but UNRWA sort of managed project. The Islamic Center is a uh, Muslim Brotherhood supported projects, so a range of different kinds of um, organizations and approaches. And then in looking at the intersection of the politics of life and the politics of living, I then um, developed several lines of argument in the book. Um, first is, is to think about um, what I call punctuated humanitarianism. And, you know, what I'm trying to explore through that concept is the move between what we can see as the humanitarian situation, that is the immediate crisis uh, that, that generates, demands, and, and energizes a humanitarian response. Uh, and of course, that is not a single event, right? There, but it, is, it describes that moment of crisis response. And then the longer term, uh, what I call the humanitarian condition, that is this chronic circumstances of living um, with need, um, and with need that is connected to that, of that crisis, but is not, is not defined by it always in the day to day. And in you know, over, over seven decades, you have a, a considerable amount of movement between crisis and chronic circumstances. So obviously 1948 is, um, it's not even the, the, the origin, but it is a origin point um, for the Palestinian refugee experience. But then you have multiple moments of crisis, 1967 being one, the, the Civil War in Lebanon being another, Black September and Jordan being another. So you have these multiple moments of returning to crisis. So for humanitarian actors, you have a challenge of responding kind of alternately to crisis and chronic and figuring out how to both shift, how to have, how to have purpose in each of those moments. And so I describe these layers of oscillating experience as punctuated humanitarianism. And that's meant precisely to capture the shifting rhythms of change, because right? sometimes that happens slowly, right? You kind of just, a crisis just kind of ebbs away and, and need continues. Um, and also there are sudden and dramatic shifts into a crisis, um, and it's also meant to capture the variety of efforts to respond and the disruptions um, that they produce. And I'm interested, as I've already indicated, with you know, I always have this kind of double lens of thinking about the, the humanitarian side and the recipient side. So I'm interested in the effects on providers and recipients of these shifts and of the and of the forms of humanitarian response. So for providers, you know, it is 
people are energized and given purpose by emergency. There's a kind of um, irony there, right? That I mean, it's not that people are happy that there's an emergency, but if you're a humanitarian aid provider, you know what to do when somebody is, is faced with a risk of dying. You may not always be able to succeed, but you know what to do. You have a clear purpose. It is much more uncertain about what to do about a chronic condition, when, it's, when there's not a very clear way to change the circumstances in which people live. Um, and at the same time, even as you know, um, crisis might energize people, humanitarian providers are incredibly frustrated by repeated destruction and by the need to cover the same ground over and over. And Gaza is a very good example of this, where just you know, every few years, the, and it's of course not the only place where this happens, but the projects that humanitarian agencies have been supporting and building, the schools they've been building, the wells they've been building are destroyed. So the smoke clears, you have to go back, you see what's been destroyed, you build again. And of course, that's, that's incredibly frustrating. For recipients, this, this oscillation and this sort of condition of punctuated humanitarianism means that people move in and out of different relationships to the humanitarian apparatus, right? So sometimes people are more closely connected to humanitarian aid and others it, it feels more distant. And of course, over even as there's this movement back and forth between crisis and chronic, there is a there is going along with that a change in the overall system. So right as a crisis reemerges, the responses are slightly different because humanitarian best practices are different, right? Or because the underlying system is different. So it's not just that you're moving from one thing to another thing, but as things are moving back and forth, the thing the the systems themselves are changing. Yeah? Um, and of course, in the midst of violence. Humanitarianism sometimes can't reach people, so you know, as much as that might be a moment where the need is evident, um, and then as I suggested, in chronic conditions, very often can't do very much for them. So, um, for example, in Wihdat, um, which is a camp in, in East Amman, um, when I was doing research there, a lot of people described, and so this was a, you know, we're doing research in, 2011, 2012, this is a moment very much in the kind of chronic period. And a lot of people describe a very limited relation to humanitarian services. So this is even as they're living in a camp, sending their children to UNRWA schools, and sometimes at least receiving health care from UNRWA clinics. So people do have a relationship to this apparatus, but what they felt to be their most acute problems, right, poverty and lack of opportunity, they managed on their own. So humanitarian, there's a sense of a receding presence of the humanitarian system, even as they live within it. Um, but of course, so here's another crisis moment. Um, after Black September in 1970, where Wehdat, along with many other refugee camps, was um, heavily damaged, and this is a, a picture of that damage. So you know, prior to that, you would have had, again, another kind of moment of Maybe not as, as intense chronicity as the mid 2000s, but you know, and kind of a moving into chronic. But of course, the crisis of Black September leads to a resurgence <coughs> of the, the provision of basic humanitarian needs. So here's the sort of provision of bread, and that's just one of many examples where this this move movement happens. One of the things that I'm looking at throughout the book is, is what it is that people do, how they live, how they make claims, how they engage in politics um, in this context. And I term, of course, it, for, for those of you um, who aren't already like deeply steeped in reading academic literature, we always need to term things something. <laughs> um, and that's for reasons both good and bad, right? So the bad is like, or I don't know, the, the less than admirable is the, is the, the, the feeling that academics have of like, we need to somehow, you know, have something that can be tagged with us, right? That somebody could say, Feldman, 2018. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the less than noble reason to, to coin something. But, but the, the more substantive, and I think this is the more fundamental, is that you want to, when you're, actually, particularly when you're writing an extended analysis of a book, you need to call a reader's attention that this is, this is something to slow down and pay attention to. And ha a conceptual framework does some of that, right? Because there's lots of lots of information that you're providing, and all of it is important. But some of it is where you want you want somebody to stop and say, "Okay, I want to think about this here." So one of the things I'm trying to think about in this book is how people engage politically in circumstances 
and in a setting that is defined as non-political. Right? Um, and so the I, I use this concept of discordant politics. What I'm trying to capture in it is really the multiplicity of refugee politics, the multiple registers, aims, and tactics um, that, that people have, and also to capture the real tension between them. So it's not just that there's like a palette of a multiple different things and people can have lots of different political claims, that people really feel that there is a tension between those and among those claims, even as they may feel that they are all important. So what are some of the registers um, for refugee claims? There is a politics of suffering, which I think would be familiar for people, but that is, I want, I want to emphasize, and I try to emphasize in the book, that the politics of suffering is only one sort of register, of, effective register of politics for refugees. There's politics of aspiration, politics of existence, you know, persistence, and of refusal. Um, and therefore of refugees as the suffering subject, which again is a real way in which people present themselves, but also as a rights-bearing category. Um, and Palestinian refugees have been insistent um, that, the, that, that not just that as Palestinians or as humans they have rights, but as refugees they have rights, so that, that it is a category that should carry rights. Um, people have ar argued for service delivery um, as a matter of justice not as, as simply a matter of charity or compassion. Um, and this politics has different temporalities. That is, it engages a f both near and distant future. So near, like a better, better life soon in the places where we are in exile, um, and, a, and the distant and, and seemingly ever more so dis idea of a future in, in Palestine. Um, different geographies, which connect to these temporalities, of course, both in close and far places, right? A politics in the camp um, and a politics from the camp. Um, and goals of different grandeur, right? So liberation, return may be the ultimate <coughs> goal, um, but improvement, improvement of life, improvement of infrastructure is also a goal. And so this picture here, actually, you know, people, again, people who are familiar with the question of Palestine generally will be very familiar with the image of keys, which very often most of the pictures that we see of Palestinian keys are keys to original homes um, in Palestine. That's not what these keys are, actually. These are keys that people are getting as they're moving from tents into shelters. Um, and this is either a refugee camp, I think. Um, and so, in some sense, I think that captures some of the discordance of the politics, right? There is a, there, there is a potential loss in accepting that key, um, but there's also there is also a demand that people make that that my life should be better now, even as I have bigger claims about um, a, a better life in the in the future. And this po this politics right um, is um, sometimes in tension with Palestinian nationalist movements for whom the 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 more distant goal, the the liberation goal. Can be, the, can be the primary register, and the more immediate goals can feel like they're getting in the way of it. It is certainly, Palestinian refugee politics is certainly in confrontation with host countries, um, who by and large do not like it when um, refugees make demands for themselves that may be at odds with state policy. Um, and it also is uh, a politics that is directed at and in, in, in critique of and in intention with the international community, where people make demands for recognition. Um, they make demands for them, and they make demands um, also of themselves, right? So I, you know, there's a, there's the, the ways in which this politics is directed in some sense outward, right, to other actors, to host countries, to, to humanitarian agencies, to an international community writ large, but this is a political conversation that also takes place among refugee communities. Um, and, and, and makes demands of each other to live as a good Palestinian subject. And of course, the, what that is, um, is a source of tension, right? Um, and again, just to underscore, I think that these multiple ways of, of thinking about political demand and political subjectivity are genuinely in conflict, right? They are discordant, um, but are also always multiple, right? Um, people do always pursue, or pretty much always I see people pursuing multiple kinds of political aims. And I think in some sense that is part of, it, of its strength, that capacity to have 
to keep um, multiple aims in focus, but it is also, um, there is also some real limits to that. So then, um, one of the things, you know, I try to explore these, the, this politics and this kind of humanitarian system through, in, you know, kind of through multiple um, lenses, and one of them is thinking about the refugee category and the refugee subject position as a um, site of politics, as a ground for politics. Um, and here again, there is kind of a built-in tension, paradox, irony, something in the fact that a non-political humanitarian category, because right, the refugee is meant precisely in its definition to be non-political. Um, that category becomes a site of politics. Um, and refugees become and insist that they are political subjects. And I think that there is um, a great deal that um, refugee politics and the refugee as a political category has to teach us about, about um, politics and the, and the form, forms of political contestation more generally. I think that refugee politics challenges existing frameworks for political contestation, um, specifically by expanding the grounds <coughs> on which people make claims within, within a given political space, and it opens up the categories of people who can claim to have standing for making such claims. So, just like to concretize that, in it, the sort of classic category of person who has standing um, to make political claims in the nation state is the citizen, right? That's what, you know, that is, it is in those terms that you, that you can make claims of the polity. Refugee politics invites other people in. It right? says so that's not the only, that's not the only uh, grounds for standing. And the aim of refugee politics is not only that refugees be recognized as political actors, that's very important, but also that the category be understood as <coughs> world forming, and this is um, language that I'm using in conversation with Hannah Arendt, but that the category be understood as world forming in itself. That is, it is not just a category of deprivation, it is not just a, um, a space that is, I mean she used the language of, sort of world poor, right, from which you cannot make a world, imagine a politics. Um, and refugees both show and insist that it is, that it is world making. Um, and it is important, I think, also to underscore that refugee articulations of possibility do not always and only express themselves as an exit strategy. So that's back to thinking about the sort of multiple levels of refugee politics, because of course the final goal would be to not be a refugee, right? To have this political problem resolved, restoration, liberation, whatever the terms of resolution, it would be to end the category. But that's not the only, um, that's not the only terms in which people are political. Displace people in a variety of circumstances well within uh, the category as they enact community, press claims, and <coughs> also experience futurity. So even if it's often difficult to affect a radical change in the world in which they live, the insistence that the refugee is a political subject as a refugee makes a significant change in how the political field is understood. And so I think that alone is very significant. Um, but then I also want to think about, so from these, you know, from the kind of st starting point of the refugee as a political subject, think about the forms of politics in which people um, engage. And they act, people act politically within the category um, in a, in a multiplicity of ways, right? And take lots of different kinds of actions to alter their present and future conditions. And I should note, as, as I think it's sort of obvious from what I've been talking about, but just but to note it again, that my focus here is not on movement politics, right? It's, um, and of course that is, you know, there's plenty of it, it's incredibly important in Palestinian political history and for Palestinian political, uh, political energy to think about um, political movements, um, but I'm looking at something else, looking at the more sort of everyday, even if it's not always exactly ordinary, expression of political effort and political claim making. And the actions that refugees take include protests and petitions um, for better services and more opportunity. Um, and actually, I should 
note about this picture. So this is a picture from the American Friends Service Committee archives. The AFSC provided aid in Gaza before UNRWA got going. And the caption of, on the picture from, from the archive is uh, responding to a riot, um, which you know, does not really look like much of a riot. Um, but, it, but that tells me that it's an, an instance of people making demands, right? People are, are asking for something. And there's, you see this over and over again, that in um, more and less organized ways, people, again, from the beginning, this is, this is in, this is in the, 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 mo the crisis moment of things, right? People have been recently displaced and, and s desperate need for, for um, rations, for shelter, for assistance. But people are not passive in the face of that need. People, and you see this all over the archival record as well as uh, ethnographic records, that you know, refugees go on strike. You know, in 1949, they 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 go on they refuse rations when the when the rations don't don't seem adequate um, in quality or quantity. So people are demanding things even from positions of great um, precarity. Um, so so you know, protests and peti petitions. They also make changes by simply making changes, right? Changing shelters, changing camps without waiting for assistance and permission. And then they also make a range of rights claims. Um, so they insist, for one, on um, their rights to humanitarianism. So in, in talking about humanitarianism as a right, um, I have a, a quote from one of my interviews here. They, you know, they, again, they specifically argue that aid is not charity, but is an obligation of the international community. So this is both a, a, a more general kind of claim that refugees might make, but in this particular context, there's a, there's a very specific claim that the international community, specifically the United Nations, has direct responsibility for their situation by supporting, encouraging, and enabling the, the both the the uh, splitting of Palestine, the creation of Israel, and the and the denial of return. Um, so they so the argument is that this is a, a fundamental obligation of the international community because of because of its responsibility. <coughs> but they also, in addition to claiming a right to humanitarianism, they also insist um, on their right to humanitarian rights. Now this and and this is part um, as. Contested as the first claim, the right to humanitarianism might be, this is even more of a kind of unsettled terrain. Because for, you know, for a lot of people who say there's a, you know, there is no such thing as humanitarian rights, right? Humanitarian, humanitarianism is about either uh, the compassionate giving or, um, I mean, for some people, it would say that protection is separate from rights. I would see protection as actually a fundamental humanitarian right, um, but there, this is a field of contest over what it might mean to claim humanitarian rights. So there are some, some concrete terms within international humanitarian law, within refugee law, that we can identify as sort of basic um, uh, humanitarian rights that would include the rights to protection. The most fundamental think is the right of non refoulement the right not to be returned to a situation in which you are vulnerable. Um, but Palestinian refugees, Palestinians have insisted on pushing, expanding the sense of what might constitute humanitarian rights. So they reference, of course, international legal instruments and conventions, but they try to push beyond them. Um, so they, and, but they also underscore, you know, again, their rights to protection. Um, and their rights not to be further displaced. So within, you know, within this 70 years, there have been, and especially, you know, West Bank and Gaza, and Gaza has been a big site of this, there's been further displacement of refugee populations. And, and Palestinians have used the terms of international law, international humanitarian law, to argue against that. Um, and in making UNRWA the addressee for these and other claims, which it very often is, like UNRWA is often a conduit um, to a broader international community um, helps our, is part of the process of articulating um, Palestinian demands and Palestinian rights claims as humanitarian rights. So just as um, Hannah Arendt noted that the right to have rights 
is more fundamental than any of the specific rights of citizens. Right? So she argues that that's kind of an underlying, there are specific rights that citizens might have in particular circumstances, but the right to have rights underlies it. Palestinians claim a general right to humanitarian rights that underlies any of the specific uh, rights demand, that they demand as refugees. Um, and of course, to, to claim or even to be acknowledged as having humanitarian <coughs> rights certainly doesn't mean that Palestinians are not refugees. Obviously, they have those rights as refugees. But to claim those rights constitutes an argument that as refugees, they should not live in the condition of what RM calls arbitrariness that she sees as fundamental to the, uh, the fundamental place of the stateless. Right? <coughs> so it's, it's a claim that what they do, did, or may do should matter, um, and therefore to redefine the condition of being a refugee. So again, just as much as any, there are particular outcomes that people are seeking, and there's been there's been some success in, in some ways, in, in reconfiguring the terrain of what, um, for example, UNRWA when it was established, did not um, have a protection mandate. We could talk about that complicated history, uh, but it had a service mandate only, unlike some other refugee regimes, and this has been a, a subject of both debate and demand from refugees, and UNRWA now claims a protection mandate. But their ability to actualize it may, you know, again, may still be limited, but that's a real change in UNRWA's understanding of its, of its purpose that is a result partly of refugee action, not only, but partly of refugee action. So the, part of what happens throughout all of this politics, both in claiming rights and in other forms of politics, is to change what it is to be a refugee. Thank you all very much. I said I was going to talk for a short period of time, but I didn't. <laughs> but we still, have, we still have half an hour for questions. So, yeah. Questions? You, thank you for coming, by the way. It's really, I appreciate that. Uh, you said politics in the camp and politics from the camp. I, can you please elaborate on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, so um, there and this is partly, you know, I'm always interested in these kind of multiple uh, layers and levels. So, you know, here and there, um, near and far. So politics in the camp can include things, I mean, can include things like actually a demand for um, improved conditions in the camp. And this, for people who have worked on, know something about the housing refugee situation, you know, this is very fraught. The question of improvement um, of the conditions in the camp sometimes, um, is identified as an, a, um, an impediment to or a potential blockage to a claim for to return. Um, and you know, host countries use that language sometimes cynically. I would say, right? A, you know, a Lebanese government, you know, insistence on you know, we will never settle Palestinians because of our support for Palestinian rights. Well, yeah, you know, I mean, whatever. But, um, <laughs> It, but it is also, but it's a language. It's a language of Palestinian national movements, and it is something that refugees feel too. Like, what are the consequences of? But if my house is a better house now, what are the what are the consequences of that for my future? But for my, you know, for the more distant future, for my future claims. But one uh, one of the things that has struck me throughout my research is the ways in which, despite that real tension, that that is real, that people want pursue the, their politics at multiple levels, and, and most people are like, I just, I have claims and rights to a better life now, and that shouldn't impact um, my rights to a liberated future down the road. <coughs> um, but so, I know this is a kind of long-winded way to get to your question, but so politics in the camp both means, I think, or what I mean by it is both a politics that is targeted at conditions in the camp, right? Changes in the camp, but also that takes place within this context. So both, you know, both the demand for improvement and the argument about whether improvement is the right demand is kind of a politics in the camp, right? And then politics from the camp is people organizing. You know, the the camp is a, is a space of collectivity, right? It provides a grounds for organizing, and again, as 
people who are familiar with Palestinian history will know a lot of Palestinian political movements and political thinking has emerged from refugee camps over over the years. And that is and so you know pol political organizing and military organizing often comes from the camps. My focus is much more on the on the former in this book and politics in the camps, um, but but about you know gesturing to what is beyond the camps. Thank you. Um, you mentioned your work in those camps in mm -hmm. those different areas, and we know the. Um, the obstacles with Gaza, but I was wondering if you had any other obstacles too from the Jordanian or the Lebanese government or any pushback on your projects. Yeah, uh, Fidel and I was actually just talking about that before. So, if, you know, every place that, in general, any place that you do field work, one, one of the first things that you need to do is sort of figure out um, the, the lay of the land, and that's in, in, uh, the lay of the, the regulatory land. Um, and, and that's also at several levels. They're like, what are the rules? And what are the rules that matter, right? You know, because um, the you know the, very often you need to find a way to, to kind of to get around certain things, but you also have to know what are the things that you can get around without causing problems to the people that you're working with or to yourself, right? So um, you know, my first um, before you know, the, the the research I did before this project, my first uh, my dissertation, my first two books were about Gaza. And, um, and this was in a different moment when it was very easy to you know, live in Gaza, go in and out and all that stuff. And the thing that's, that, you know, one thing that I've noted as, as I did this project is that um, the, the occupation was not a very, for when I was doing work, was not a big obstacle to doing research. It's a big obstacle to all sorts of things, but not a big obstacle to doing research. Jordan is the, the place that I have done research where I've had the most direct engagements with security services and the the you know the yeah the 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 their effort to impose on research so um for those of you who've been to the gaza camp know that this is you know most of the past so again i'm sorry i'm gonna give a long-winded context um answer to to respond to but most palestinian refugees in jordan are citizens of the country that's a fraud place, but, but they are citizens of the country. There is a portion of Palestinian refugees in Jordan who came to Jordan from Gaza in 1967 after the occupation um, and who are not citizens of the country. So their condition in Jordan is more um, analogous, actually, to the situation of Palestinian refugees in Lebanon. Um, and there you know, are a couple hundred thousand Gazans in the country, and the, the Jadash camp, known as the Gaza camp, is a camp that it's not the only place where, where ex Gazans, as they're called, live, but it, it is a camp that, that is basically entirely um, that population. So that makes it extra sort of um, under the eye of Jordanian security services. So if you're doing research in the camps in Jordan, you are required to get permission from the Department of Palestinian Affairs. Now, if you're working in Wehdat, which is one place I work, it sort of doesn't matter. Right? Nobody's gonna nobody's gonna bother you, notice you. You know, I mean, I did go through this, but it but it's um, practically speaking. So the, the the rules. What are the rules you need to pay attention to? Nobody there. With that, is built into Amman. You know, it's just it's you're not gonna be noticeable. Jedash, on the other hand, again because this is a population of people who are not citizens, um, and it's distant. You know, from it's near the city of Jadash, but it's it's it's, a, it's fairly kind of in a rural area, so it's not you're very noticeable when you go there. Um, and so I had the experience of um, I got permission from the Department of Palestinian Affairs um, in the Amman, and you know you have your paper. And, you know, um, and, but when I got to the camp, so that's one permission, but that's far, you know that's far away. I got to the camp and a big and there was all sorts of interest in more local level um, security personnel in um, being involved in this research. So, I mean, there is a um, camp committee that is not, you know, in some places, like in the occupied territories and in Lebanon, the camp committees <coughs> are, uh, they're called popular committees, and there's still all sorts of problems about their popularity, but they, they emerge out of like local political movements, right? They're faction, they're basically faction-based.
In Jordan, these committees are appointed by the government. So then you kind of have the worst possible situation, which is people with absolutely no power and, and who, are, who are themselves remain vulnerable, but given a little bit of something. Um, and so um, this is when I was starting my research. I'm going to try to, I'm going to try to knit, make it a little shorter. When I was starting my research, per, Jordanian security personnel and, and representatives of the, of the <coughs> committee came and told me that, um, okay, well, so yeah, you have this commission, that's fine, but somebody from the, the committee needs to go with you on all of your interviews and all of your research. And so I'm trying, you know, I have this back and forth and, you know, trying to explain ethnographic methods and the, you know, without, <laughs> you know, and why, how you can't do that and then, without, without insulting them or without, you know, and I was really, you know, it, I was a little bit at, at an impasse, and I ultimately sort of got out of that problem. What, what people in the camp were already telling me is like, they'll get you know, this won't this won't go on because eventually people they'll get used to you and tired of you and they won't bother you. I was like, all well and good, but if they, but if this is how it starts, that's you know that's kind of the end of the research, right? Um, and one of my research assistants basically said, it's a small community, right? Basically convinced the, the the members of his committee that they didn't need to get involved and be okay, he'd be sure to let them know if anything of any significance happened. And I, I, I'm sure he would have, right? You know. um, so I was able to do the research without their direct involvement, but I, but it, it brought home to me things that I was already sort of cognizant of, but it really brought it home was one, um, how potentially vulnerable the people that I was going to be talking to were, how careful um, I should be. I mean, of course, they understand much better than I the, the red lines, but um, but that I, as a researcher, have a responsibility to be careful about people. And so, of course, you know, I'm doing a project where I mean, part one of the things I'm interested in is politics. And we never spoke directly about the question of politics. Of course, I mean, of course, the politics I'm interested in isn't so much like, you know, the monarchy. Yeah. The um, <laughs> but. Um, you know, and I've, you know, as you and I have talked about someone, I would love to have talked to people about Black September, which came up periodically. I would never ask a question about that. Like, if somebody mentioned something about it, I, I was interested. But I, these are, they're just things that I did not talk to people about there because there was no reason to assume that even though I was able to pursue my research without somebody in the room, I should never presume that people weren't going to know what was going on in the room. And in fact, I had, um, you know, I worked there over the years, and when my, the, initially, I was working with two research assistants, a man and a woman, and then later was, I was just working with a woman. But the, my male research assistant got called in to the Mukhabarat multiple times. Not the woman. You know, again, that tells you something. Yeah. Intelligence and service. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the security services. And Those of us familiar with the Arab world right. know the word well. <laughs> <laughs> But basically was asked to, you know, what, you know, she has permission from this other office. We can't stop the research, but, you know, this is, this is sensitive what's going on. So, you know, that's, that was a real, that was a real factor in shaping um, both the contours of the research, but also what I talked to people about. And in Lebanon, again, you know, that's obviously an incredibly fraught place to be a Palestinian, but there isn't any of that in, in the context of the research. What the, the, the people that I needed to kind of get from, you know, and it's not formal, but get permission from to work in Borja Barajne, um, and I'll explain why I'm emphasizing that this, like these camps around Beirut was the popular committee, right? So I needed to like have my presence known and kind of that's okay. Um, if you want to go to camps in the south, and I did make you know some shorter trips that weren't, weren't the primary site of my research, that you need to get a permit from the Lebanese army, and so that you know so that. The camp, even within a country, the camp, the conditions in the camps are very different. So Borja Barajna, you could go in and out. There wasn't anybody there. Um, but, you know, Rashadia, there's a military checkpoint. And you can't go in um, as a foreigner, as a non-Palestinian, without a without permit, which, you know, there's a lot of history. Sorry, I have to, I have a little... No, it's very all very interesting. <laughs> no. Uh, thank you so much for your important work. Um, I think I have a first a follow-up question on your choice of the camps. Was it a matter of access to these camps, or was there something particular that you were trying to highlight? And then my second question is about the archives. I was wondering if you can talk more about if you had any challenges, were there archives in Jordan 
And then my third question, sorry. Um, you mentioned that you did your research in 2011 and 2012, and that's during the uprising. And I was wondering from your conversations with people if you felt, because of the context, the rhetoric of the politics of suffering were downplayed or like the uh, persistent resistance were highlighted more, or how did you feel that affected the... The I'll just start with the last question. I, I did the research for this project over from like 2007 to 2014. I was, but but kind of in steps, right? Because I'm looking at multiple different places, and so that so it becomes a very interesting thing. Because when I'm in Wehdet is different than when I'm in Dehesha, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so the political. I mean, they're obviously they're you know they're it's not it's not some other era, but there but there were there were different moments and. Um, you know, like for example, I was working in Borja Barajne in the kind of period that was leading up to when Mahmoud Abbas was bringing the the, youth, the recognition of Palestine to the UN. Um, so that was something that I talked a lot with people about at that moment in the in the camp. Um, but the Arab uprisings, you know, I think they were in some sense less. There was, you know, some set some discussion about it, but um, in Jordan, in the Jordan camps, not so, it wasn't like a, a, it actually wasn't, I don't think, a central, it wasn't a central topic of conversation, um, but it may, every every kind of political moment that you're in shapes how it is that you're thinking about, people are thinking about political possibility and impossibility and imagining change, but again, talking about imagining Real political change in Jordan is a. I don't know why I'm gesturing to you. But <laughs> <laughs> representative of the Jordanian. Uh, <laughs> um, is is fraught at any time, right? Yeah. You know, so um, 